What's going on, guys? Sensible Prepper Live for school. We're going to be talking about the basics today. Now, one thing I would say, if you've been prepping a long time, uh, this may be a, just a quick refresher course. You know, sometimes, I mean, I've been prepping for many years, and sometimes I just kind of lose track. And so I think this is just some of the basics. It is the top five. It is your priorities, but it, it's not all encompassing. There's a lot more to go. Uh, but one of the things that I really want to talk about right up front is you can't do it all. And really what prepping does, uh, and this is mainly for beginners, what prepping does is it buys you some time. So let's say, you know, you have food stored up, you have, you know, a full pantry or you have some extra cans of food and you have some things set back. Let's say you have some water, uh, you have just bottles of water or jugs of water and you have a few put back. This is, again, it's just going to buy you time. Think about it this way. You're not really prepared. Your pantries, you, you kind of shop every week and you put groceries in and you go through them and then you're back to the grocery store, which we all do to a point. If you have no supplies, if you have nothing that you can count on, it puts you in a panic situation. So really what prepping does is it gives you some peace of mind. It lets you kind of step back and go, OK, things are bad. <laughs> I'm, I'm worried but I have some time to make some rational decisions and kind of think things through. That's the big thing about prepping. Now, you can go to total self-reliance where you have your own gardens, you have chickens, you have livestock. I mean, you're self-sufficient. And if you're really serious about prepping and you really want to be that way, it takes a lot of work. But that's really where you need to start thinking about heading to. So this is not necessarily we're going homesteading. We're going to be able to, to survive for, you know, 10 years. Uh, this is just here we have good supplies and it gives us a good start and it gives our family a good chance of survival. Now, before we get started, uh, Robbie Wheaton won't be here today. Something's come up. So you're just going to have to put up with me. But also Sarah Mack is over on the computer and she will be monitoring questions. We'll take breaks probably in between each of the five different sections. Uh, and we'll answer some questions. They don't have to be necessarily um, specific to this, but they need to be about prepping. And also, we want to just give a big thank you to Exotac, uh, some of the best fire starters on the market. Now, one of the things about fire starting is you need a fire kit. You need the ability to create fire. And a Bic lighter is not always the best choice. It's the most convenient, but they can go out. And so having a few multiple ways to start fire is vital. And also having some tinder, some way to get the fire going. Uh, and tinder tabs are a great way to do it. And Exotac carries those. And they give you a 20% discount using Such20 with the link down below in the description. We really appreciate those of you who have supported that because... <laughs> it's a nice support for us. But Exotech is my favorite. And again, they're made all in the USA down in Winder, Georgia. They are the best, the best. Okay, so you're you're just starting to prep. You're looking around. You're going, you know, uh, we had COVID-19. That was nuts. But I'm kind of over that. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the economy. Uh, food prices have gone up 40% <laughs> over the past couple of years. Gas prices have just remained high. A lot of our regular basic cost, if you'll go to a restaurant, it's just a lot more expensive. Uh, and whether you go, no matter what you're looking for, things have gone up. Prices have gone up, which means that there is less supply. And two, it means that our dollar is worth less. So what do I start doing? What is the number one thing that I want to kind of start focusing on? And I would say the first thing, to me, the priority is food. You've got to eat, guys. I mean, you know, you've got to eat. And there's a lot of different ways to put food back. But one of the easiest and one that we've kind of really started relying on is just canned food. Um, cans are fairly reasonable. They last pretty much longer than you live. <laughs> but the one big reason about canned food, and we, we did a review on this about how long does canned food last, and it really will last fairly indefinitely because they're using the, the sanitary processes they're using, the vacuum, the heat process, the sterilization, 
that they're using to can food is over the top. And so a lot of this food will just last. Now, one problem that you could have is if you have something that's very acidic, like tomatoes or uh, oranges or tangerines, those can actually cause some issues with the can. But most of these cans are lined. And so they have the lining inside and it's really easy and, and they last a long time. Now, there are some telltale signs about canned food. If you open it up and it smells bad, well, then throw it out. Uh, if a can's been dented, um, you know, typically you want to go ahead and use it. If a can is swelled, you don't want to do that. If, a, if the food looks really like this, just unedible, uh, you know, there's some signs there where you want to, to be aware of. But honestly, canned food will last a long time. Now, the big problem with canned food is that it's heavy. Uh, here we have some tactical bacon. And this is from CMMG. This was Christmas present. But I mean, there's all kind of different food that you can have. Soups, of course, canned vegetables, canned meats. I mean, there's a ton of different things. And if you'll watch, sometimes even on YouTube, they'll have guys that'll open up rations from World War I that are in cans. And that's way before a lot of the scientific and the hygiene um, measures that they went to to can these. And a lot of them are still good. Some of them don't taste the best, but they do have some nutrition. Now, the problem is over time is your food will lose nutrition. One thing that you need to be careful of, too, is where you store your food. Uh, you know, putting it in a, a temperature controlled environment will let it last a long time. Keeping it out of the sunlight uh, also you know, we like to put it, uh, well, we have it in our garage. And we also have a room we call the grocery store that's upstairs. Again, though, canned food is heavy. So make sure that if you are storing this on shelves, that it, they're very sturdy. Because we did have an issue one time <laughs> where we had some shelves that just weren't up to par. And actually, the shelves broke and we had a big mess. But uh, we fixed it and we got better shelves. Now, also, there's a lot of different uh, dehydrated foods or freeze-dried foods. A lot of these are camping for going camping. They're lightweight. You just add water to them, heat them up, and they make a delicious meal. And so the one thing you want to be careful of with some of these is the sodium content. Sometimes it's really high in preservatives, really high in sodium. And so that can be an issue because it's just going to make you more thirsty and it's just not good for your body. So be careful, whatever it is. I believe this is backpack. No, this is on right on trek. I don't, I, in fact, this is one that I got, and I think one of the battle boxes. But there's a number of different ones. Backpackers Pantry, uh, Mountain House Foods. I mean, there's so many different ones. Now, the problem with a lot of this is they're fairly expensive. Uh, so to me, what I like to do is, is have an array of these set aside and then have my canned food as well. Uh, one thing that you can use, especially what we're going to talk about in a minute, is something that you may need to carry with you or something in a bag. And this is lifeboat food. It'll last five years. And this has like 2,500 calories in one bar. And what's really cool is it tastes great. It tastes like graham crackers, uh, but it's soft. It's uh, It has some moisture to it and it keeps you from getting thirsty. It's lifeboat food. But there are a number of different options. And of course, you can do a lot of this on your own. You can can food. You can freeze dried food yourself, dehydrate food uh, to give it that extra shelf life. But let me just say this, guys. Again, if you are brand new and thinking, OK, I need to get started. I want you to think about it this way. Let's say you go to the grocery store and you pick up three or four cans, extra cans of whatever, just something that you're going to eat. That is putting you ahead from where you are now. And every time you do that, it puts you ahead of where you are. You don't have to go out and run your credit card up. In fact, I advise you not to do that. Go out, take some extra money. Maybe instead of going out one night that you would go out, take that money and go and buy some different food and put it back. Uh, it's really simple to do. And guys, food is vital. You know, um, especially during a grid down or a stressful situation, we burn about 2000 calories. Men do about 2000 calories a day. And so you need to think that through is how many calories do I need? But the first off and really your priority is just get food, be able to sustain yourself, have sustenance and be able to live, especially if you have a family. What you don't want to do is to have no food, and then you're in a panic and then you become desperate. Guys, I'll tell you, you know, uh, here in the U.S. especially, I mean, we've lived with a lot of prosperity. We have more prosperity 
than any other country. And then some people argue that, but honestly, we have tons of food stores. We have a lot of arable lands. But I'm telling you guys, there is a lot going on if you watch what's going on in Europe right now with a lot of these green energy initiatives. And the reason why these French farmers, the German farmers, the Dutch farmers are uh, demonstrating and pretty much, I mean, it's almost a riot <laughs> is because they're trying to stop food production. They're saying that food production is hurting the earth. In Ireland, uh, just a few weeks ago, they were trying to force uh, ranchers to kill 200,000 cattle because they were causing problems on the earth. I'm telling you what, guys, there are some sinister forces. And this isn't um, conspiracy. Just watch what the World Economic Forum was talking about, and you'll see that this is really what they're thinking. A lot of people are buying up, including Bill Gates, has bought up a lot of farmland here in the U.S. And a lot of times, he's just stopping production. So, guys, Food is going to be vital. Uh, it's going to be vital whether we have a grid down situation or not. I think it's very important to get food. And the one thing to understand is while food prices have gone up, they're not finished. So the more food you buy today, the more it's going to save you money in the future. And we've seen that a number of times. So food is vital. Food is important. Now, the second step to that would be to have a garden. And guys, if you've always kind of thought, you know, I wouldn't mind having a garden. Uh, or and you have a small place for a garden, just at least supplement your diet with fresh fruits, fresh vegetables. Uh, you know, for us, I mean, like having chickens, you know, having eggs. I mean, those are things that are fairly simple to get into, but yet it may not sustain your whole family, but at least it'll give you a bonus. It'll give you extra food, again, to supplement the preps that you have, and they'll last longer. So, First off on the list, very first, is food. And it's vital that you go ahead and have some food put back. And let's face it, guys, nothing ever happens. Prices start coming down, then eat it. Now, one thing, too, I would recommend is when you're going to buy food, just don't buy a bunch of food. Buy foods that you'll eat. Buy foods that are part of your diet. Now, you say, well, I don't eat canned food. Well, look for things I mean, like this. This is um, Amy's Hearty Organic Soups. <laughs> if this will make you feel better, this is a great way to go. And then again, you know, organic beans. I mean, there's a number of things that they're putting out low sodium. So, but buy the things that you'll eat. And I highly recommend pulling them out every once in a while. One thing that we did was we got uh, Denny Moore beef soup, got a bunch of cans of it, put it back. So we opened up a can of it. It had been years since I'd eaten any of that. And it's really good. I mean, it's really tasty. Now, it's not like going to, you know, the chop house or somewhere, but it definitely is better than starving to death. So food is number one on the list. Now, uh, number two is water. And honestly, number one is water because you can only live three days without water. You can live three weeks without food, but you need food to keep your energy up. But water, I mean, it's plentiful, at least here in this part of the country. We live in South Carolina, and so water is plentiful. Uh, and then there are all kinds of different ways to be able to store water. Now, this is an aquatainer, and if you want to store some water, this is a great way to do it. These are really solid. Uh, they're very safe for water. They're made to carry water and to hold water. Uh, you can get these in a number of places, including Walmart to REI. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons to have water set aside. Uh, now, of course, there are small bottles and things like that. But having some kind of filter system is also important. Uh, for us, we have the Big Berkey. We've been, in fact, we have the Imperial, and we've been using it every day for about, I don't know, about ten years. Uh, and we you, we cook with it, we drink our water with it, we make our tea with it. And so because now we can't even drink tap water because it just is it tastes terrible. So for us, water is vital. And but let's say that you don't have a room, you know, you don't have room to store up water. Make sure that you get some bleach and bleach. You can put um, I believe it's 16 drops of bleach in a uh, one gallon container and that will uh purify your water. It kills the germs, it kills things. Because listen, don't go to a creek fill up your aquatainer and then drink water out of it because there's there are all kind of different uh, chemicals and bacteria 
that really can cause you to get really sick or even to die. You don't know what's going on above your stream. Uh, we have a creek here and it's beautiful and it's clear and it, you just think you can drink right out of it. But you, you've got to be careful not to do that. Now, also, there are portable water filters like the Katadyne Hiker Pro. I've got one of those. I use it for like when I'm out going camping, hiking, doing things. But also one thing is the Frontier uh, is Aquamira filter straw. And they make the Pro and they'll filter up to 11 gallons. The small ones and the larger ones are about 25 gallons. Again, it gives you some time. Uh, and you can also boil your water. Now, the one problem with bleach and boiling water is that it doesn't remove the sediment. It doesn't remove the smell uh, or even the taste. So if you have water that's not really that clean, uh, make sure that you strain it before you boil it or before you even treat it. And of course, there are uh, you know water treatment tab tablets and you can drop those in. It takes time. But again, you don't remove the sediment, the smell or the taste. It, you're going to have that, but you will have water. So, you know, you have to go with what you can. I mean, let's say you're on a real tight budget. I can't run out and buy a bunch of, of these or even these water, you know, these waters, because even though these waters like this gallon water or the water bottles are fairly inexpensive, uh, if things start to ranch it up, people are going to start buying those things to be able to supplement their water supply. Great thing is, is hopefully we've got water coming in you know, from our municipal sources or from a well. Now, if you have a well, that, that works well too. But the, the fact is, is water is vital. And it's one of those things that you need to make sure that you take care of. Also, what I would do beginning to prep is to locate a water source that I can get to. So if I need water and there's no water coming in, then I can go and have something, a container to be able to fill that water up with. And then I can treat it if I need to. Um, and, you know, sometimes there would be maybe even um, like Red Cross or some different FEMA or whatever that may show up with water and you've got to come and bring your containers. So having containers like this to me is something that's very important because this water's heavy. One gallon of water weighs about eight pounds. So it's heavy and you really need at least one gallon of water per person per day. And so that can really be a chore to be able to procure your water. One thing that we do, we have rain catchment systems. Now they take a lot of maintenance, but it's a great way to be able to get water really freely. And typically because it's rainwater, it's fairly clean, but that is another option. Now we're going to go to some questions in just a second. But um, again, water, water, filters, Having those things set aside, and guys, honestly, the filter systems, especially the Aquamira filters, they're not that expensive, and you can have those to be able to treat your water. And obviously, bleach is fairly inexpensive. Keeping bleach back, it's not a big deal. It's really inexpensive. One thing, though, I will warn you, if you're going to boil your water, you need to have at least a large pot. Uh, the larger the pot, the more water you can boil, and the less fuel you're going to use, than if you're putting multiple smaller pots onto a fire. So, and again, that's where your fire kit comes in. All right, let's see if we have some questions. Uh, Dave Ma asked question, in SHTF, and I'm protecting my home, what are the steps to fortifying as far as windows and bullets that will penetrate a non-brick home? Should I build some kind of core to take cover? Well, you know, and that's a good question. Uh, the thing about houses, and I was watching an old episode of Bonanza the other day, and there were these women and they were defending their home and they're down, they're, they're at the window and they get down by the wall. Well, bullets go right through walls, right through them. And like he said, you know, with brick, you have a little more protection, but bullets will still take out that after a few, few rounds. Um, you know, a lot of homes around the world are built with concrete. The concrete would be a great way as well. But your home is pretty much not really defensible against gunfire. Uh, you know, those bullets will pass straight through uh, and they'll go through sheetrock. Uh, they may be, you know, deterred if it's a, a two by four or something that it hits and it may keep it from, from penetrating. But those are, are few and far between when it comes to self-defense. Um, one thing that for me, if I was in an SHTF situation, um, I would put maybe have sandbags set aside and you could put sandbags and build up a small defensive area uh, that you might be able to defend uh, that because sandbags are great for that. Uh, sand will stop the bullets. 
uh, flower pots around the house, uh, around the windows, you know, those are also full of dirt. And so that also helps from, uh, but honestly, it's very difficult with the structures of homes that we live in now to be able to defend them. Um, one thing that we have done or plan to do, I should, I should say, cause we haven't done it is around some of our areas on our landscaping. We've talked about building some concrete walls that are decorative and have plants on them and they look nice but they can also double for a defensive position. Uh, now, I read a book years ago. It was John Wesley Rawls, and it was uh, Survivors or Patriots. I think it was the name of the book. Great book. But one of the things they did was go into their house, and they put AR-500 steel all under the walls. Now, that's not only very heavy, but it's very expensive. And so, in fact, I remember when I read that, I thought, well, there ain't no way I could ever do that. Uh, so, you know, really, your choices are limited. But to me, having a bunch of sandbags, you don't have to have them all filled up. And obviously, you know, your wife's not going to really be happy about you having your living room with all these sandbags stacked up. But in a grid down situation, that is one thing that really uh, could be. You could have the bag separate. You could have a big thing of sand brought in and have it back and fill them up, load up your area. And to me, that's probably one of the least expensive ways. Now, one thing I'll give you a tip on is even for now uh, with break ins and things like that. Uh, having your doors reinforced is very important. That's really how criminals come in. A few years ago, we had a break in and somebody came through the window, came through the kitchen window. And the deputy, when he got there, he said, that's really unusual. People usually go through doors. They don't usually crawl through windows, which was surprising a little bit to me. But one thing you can do to protect your windows is get the 3M film. Uh, and th there's a number of companies that will do it. And they put the film on the outside of your windows. And it's completely see-through. It's, it's great. I mean, there's no, uh, no adverse effect. It's a little expensive. But the, the great thing is it's not bulletproof. But if somebody's trying to throw a rock through your window, they're trying to bust out your window, or they're trying to throw a Molotov cocktail in your house, uh, it'll bounce off. And yes, the glass may crack, crack, but that film will hold the glass in place. And so it makes it very difficult for someone to get in. If you have a glass door and you're concerned about safety, some people, and I have friends that have just a glass door, that's their door. And they have 3M <laughs> protection on it. And so that, that really helps. But yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing. And really, um, to me, one of the best is like sandbags. Again, it's just uh, in an SHTF situation, desperate times call for desperate measures. Ernie Andrews says, just got me a truck. How should I start prepping if um, bugging out? Well, you know, I did this a while back where I just put all the items I had in my Jeep and I kind of set it up for a bug out situation. And I'm going to tell you, it was super tight. Uh, so having room uh, in the back to be able to protect what you have, you know, even a camper cover or something, a cargo bins in the back. Here's the thing about bugging out. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. That's going to be on, that's one of the things on the list because you need to have that in the back of your mind is that there's a lot of stuff when you evacuate your home, which has your supplies, which has what you need on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's not like you can throw that stuff in a three-day bag and yes, you may survive, but you're going to be really hard pressed. So having a truck set up, again, with cargo compartments to be able to organize your gear, um, you know, even with racks on top, even if it's just over the cab, um, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. One of the things I would recommend is just looking, especially on Pinterest. It's pretty cool. There's a number of different setups that people have used to uh, make their vehicle a bug out vehicle and even trucks, Jeeps, even cars. Uh, and you have to go with what you have. but I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do, not really something that I could possibly get into right now, but get on there, do some research. You will find a lot, a lot of cool stuff. We have a place uh, not uh, that we've done some, we've done business with that's called Big Boy Trucks. And it's a place that you just have all kind of stuff they'll do. They'll put racks on your um, SUV. They have uh, fog lights. They have different kind of things. They'll put gas cans, you know, bolted onto the outside of your vehicles. So there are places like that that will do the work. So I would just kind of do some research and check into it. Uh, Jerez and Josh ask, can you please do a video on your martial arts training? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I've been doing martial arts for uh, years and years, um, and it's been different styles of martial arts. So I am currently uh, doing Kempo Karate, and um, my phone's going off like crazy. Uh, we're cur Currently, my daughter and I are doing Kempo Karate, and uh, we've been doing it now for a, a good while, but it was a brand new art for us. So, um, you know, I'm just at Purple Belt right now, and Sarah Mack. She's blue and getting ready to go on. So, um, you know, th there is a lot that goes on there. Uh, I've taken Shurin Ru, which is a uh, Taekwondo, and then also Jiu Jitsu, uh, Goju Ru. So, <laughs> the one thing about martial arts, though, and I'm going to tell you guys, when you, it is a very important thing to me uh, to take because it gives you a lot of, it gives you a different perspective. And it also enables you to start to react and to think about, you know, if I'm in this situation, what am I going to do? Uh, and two, especially for younger kids, if they're if it's the right teacher, it gives them a lot of confidence, but it gives them a humility. And I, I like that. It was one of the things that was a big deal for me when I was young, um, because I was just in middle school when I started and, uh, you know, got to that age where I was a little bit like cocky. And taking martial arts really kind of disciplined me, uh, you know, to say, hey, karate is my secret. You know, I pray that I don't use it. I bear no weapons. And, you know, you, you kind of use that as just like you would a concealed carry piece. You had the responsibility, but you don't. So we'll see about that. I mean, that's a that's a big subject. Uh, David Shetzhut asks, hello, what kind of exercises for prepping, weightlifting, running, calisthenics? Well, you know, all the above. Uh, honestly, stretching is one of the best things you can do, especially when you start getting older. We get more locked in. Uh, but and that's one of the things with martial arts is a lot of stretching, uh, walking, just walking. Um, you know, running is excellent, uh, but walking in itself is a great way to get out and exercise. Lifting weights and building up your strength is also important. So really any exercise you do and back off from the table a little bit which is something that, you know, especially for us men, it's difficult to do because, you know, I want to clean that plate. But guys, get to a point where you're full and stop. Just stop. It, you know, you may have more food on the plate. Just let it go. It's not that you're losing money by eating that. You're gaining something that really is a detriment to yourself. So just back off from the table. But guys, honestly, getting in good shape is very important. On the other side, I've heard reports with people talking about people that have extra weight Actually, because they have that extra weight, when food's not available as much, they actually tend to thrive even better. But it does put a lot of strain on you. But really, any kind of exercise is a good thing. And the more we sit around, the more set, you know, sedimentary we get, it, you know, you need to be active. So, OK, let's we're going to come back to some questions, but let's go ahead and continue. We've talked about food. We've talked about water. Those are the big two, uh, the big ones. Now. Also, medical. Medical is vital. And guys, you know, it may be scary to you because for me, you know, um, it's like black magic. I think I don't know what to do here. Uh, really, it's very simple. It's very simple. Uh, and we took some classes from uh, Medical Gear Outfitters and uh, Skinny Medic, Skinny Medic YouTube channel. Great channel, by the way. But we went to some of those classes. It was trauma classes or stop the bleed classes. And it's really not that difficult if you know what you're doing. And that's really the big thing. But having a way to be able to treat. Now, there may still be hospitals, doctors, whatever, emergency services, but they may be overtaxed. And if you have a, one of your family members gets really injured, you want to be able to help them. Uh, and so we have a number of different things. This is actually from... Um, North American Rescue. And I got this at Palmetto State Armory. It is a trauma kit. It's in this small little container. Uh, we take this to the range with us when we go shooting. And that's one thing I would highly recommend, guys. You go to the range, have a trauma kit. It's very important because some accidents can happen. Uh, one thing, though, and this is from AMP3, uh, and this is USN ER doc. <clears throat> and this is one of his uh, clinics in a roll. And there is all kind of, in fact, I've done a couple of reviews on this. But you roll it out. You've got all the different items you need, all the way from even dental and eye care. 
but burn care, uh, all kind of different things. Of course, it does have trauma. It has Band-Aids. It has regular things, galls and things like that. This is a great thing to have. Uh, when we go on any kind of trip, this goes in the back of the car. Also, we have a big medical bag. Uh, my wife is an RN for about 20 years, and so she is all about medical. And uh, in our prepper group, we have a number of different medical professionals that are in the group. And so medical is super important, not just a little first aid kit. That's not enough. But also with that, with the different trauma, which trauma kits are probably the most evasive, the most um, dangerous situations that you might be in, having a trauma kit is important. But also just having some normal, like Imodium, your Tylenol, um, you know, Pepto-Bismol, different type things that you may need uh, when you get sick. Because what you don't want to do is to have uh, to get so dehydrated and then, uh, you know, you could possibly die just from that. So you want to make sure that you have some of your normal medications put back. Uh, and guys, a lot of times, you know, our medicine cabinet's all full of stuff and we got all kinds of things. And then all of a sudden you pick it up and go, whoops, this is empty. So take a good inventory and look and see what you have and have a couple of extras. Tums. Tums is one thing. Sometimes in the middle of the night I start, you know, having acid reflux. And so Tums, I have to, you know, it's like I've got to have it. And so if I run out of that, then what's my next step? Also looking at different, yes, my daughter always tells me to get drink a big glass of milk and that does help. But if you don't have milk, that ain't going to help you either. <laughs> so having some medical supplies put back, splints. Um, I'll tell you one thing that's really important. And I got this from Bear Independent uh, is having a lot of galls. I mean, a lot of galls. We, over the years, you know, we've had galls in different packs and oh, if we need it, we'll just pull it out. The thing to, to think about is if you have a gunshot wound or you're chopping wood and you cut your leg really bad and it's a really deep cut and you really need to keep it clean, you're going to need to use that gauze and then take it off, clean it and replace new gauze on there. And it could take weeks for that to heal. And so having a big container of galls to me is going to be one of those important things that you have. And it's something that a lot of us don't think about. So having your standard medical supplies, the things that you use on an everyday basis, having chapstick, um, you know, just different things that are going to help you to get through situations. But also, again, trauma kits are vital. They're at the top of the food chain. And then it goes just to standard medical supplies that you may need in an emergency situation. And they come in all kinds of sizes. Now, this is one. It's just a, a small little kit. It has, it's really an advanced first aid kit. It's not a trauma kit, but it has a lot of things that can get you around. Um, Israeli bandages are some of the best. Those are great. Uh, you can wrap those up. You can use them for all kinds of different purposes. Uh, even a tourniquet. There's a lot of things you can do with Israeli bandages. But one of the things, guys, I'm going to highly recommend when it comes to medical is at least go to the Red Cross and, you know, get the, their basic first aid. But if you can get something more advanced, there are classes and I don't know all of them, but there's a lot of classes out there that you can go to and be able to get some training that will take you a long way in medical. Again, it's not black magic. Yes, surgery and some other things, they can definitely be beyond our scope. Um, one thing, though, that a lot of people try to do is think about antibiotics. You know, if you have an infection, man, you know, it could be a death sentence. And so, you know, with antibiotics, you can treat it. The problem is, is, of course, without a doctor, you can't really get antibiotics. But uh, a lot of the uh, fish antibiotics and different type animal, the ones that treat animals are actually made on the same lines that they make uh, antibiotics for humans. But this is the problem. You don't know what that antibiotic may treat. It's not like one antibiotic just treats everything. It takes different antibiotics. You may be allergic to something. Uh, those antibiotics may not work on what you're dealing with. And so I would caution you when it comes to just buying a lot of antibiotics from some company uh, that are designed actually for animals or at least marketed to animal care and use those, not because that would hurt you in itself, but because it may not treat what you have. Uh, so that is just a, a, a warning right there. Okay. Now the next thing on the list is self-defense. Now in a live 
we can't touch a hand. We can't touch any firearms. <laughs> in fact, one time I was here and I touched, we had it on a, re on a rest. We had it where we wouldn't do it. And I just put my finger on it and they shut us down. So uh, behind me, if I don't know if you can see it, is of course an AR-15. And that seems to be America's favorite rifle. It's one of those things that's highly versatile. There's a lot of parts. You can work on them. Uh, they're simple. Uh, they've been used by the U.S. military for a long, since the early 60s. Uh, so having a some kind of rifle, and I call it my go-to rifle, uh, it gives you a, a higher round capacity and it gives you distance. You know, a, a rifle like this, you can shoot out to four or 500 yards, 600 yards uh, with a good scope. You know, you can be really good at it. But um, there's also other options. And honestly, guys, having just even a hunting rifle, because here's the problem. Most people have an old shotgun. Now, I've got a shotgun sitting back there. The three firearms to me that I'm going to recommend, uh, and I'm going to give you a fourth one as a bonus, but number one is to have a handgun. A handgun is a personal self-defense item. It's something you can carry concealed. It's something that you can carry with you. Uh, but the problem with a handgun is that it's limited in distance. Uh, number two is a shotgun. Shotguns are devastating. They're one of the best home defense options that you have, and but they're great at close range, but they're not so good after about 40 yards or 50 yards with buckshot, and if you get slugs, you're limited to about 100 yards or so. So if you have a handgun and you got your old shotgun, you really need something to be able to reach out a little bit longer. Because if I have a rifle and I'm sitting up on a ridge and all you have is a shotgun and a pistol, I can command what's going on. And so you need to have some way to be able to reach back. So a rifle that at least, again, it could be just a bolt action rifle. To me, optimal is AR-15, AK-47, something like that, that has multiple round capacity uh, that, you know, is, is built really um, for, you know, more of a defense type situation. So, uh, but, and there are a lot of different options out there. If you have an M1 carbine, that would be fine. If you have an SKS rifle, uh, or again, just a bolt action hunting rifle, it gives you a standoff capability to be able to keep people back. And, and, and guys, we're defending. We're not, a, we're not offensive. We're not going on the offensive. We're all about defending our families, defending our property. But those are the big three, a rifle, a shotgun, and a pistol. But then the bonus is a 22. 22s are excellent. You can take a lot of ammunition. They can pack up really small. Uh, there's a number of different options out there. And 22 is the most popular caliber in the world. You can usually find it almost anywhere. Uh, of course, a lot of countries now have become very regulated with ammunition and prohibitive. But as far as here in the U.S., 22 is just an excellent way to go. Now, you've got a rifle. You got a couple of boxes of ammunition, you're hurting. You need to have some ammunition put back. One thing that we did years ago when they had the first assault weapons ban is ammunition dried up, just like it did after Sandy Hook, just like it's done a number of times. It just dries up. Um, or if you can find it, it's very expensive. What I like to do and what we did, we'd go into whatever gun shop or we'd go into Walmart for that matter, and we would pick up a box of ammunition every week. Maybe it's 22, maybe it's 9 millimeter, maybe it's 5.56 or uh, the AK ammo 7.62 by 3.9. And we just get a box and put it back. Man, before long, we had a decent stash of ammunition. Uh, same thing with food. It's the same principle. Buy a little bit, buy a little bit, buy a little bit, do it weekly. Just spend a little bit of extra money on that. Before long, you have a nice uh, stock of canned food, ammunition, whatever you're looking for. Uh, but also, especially if you have a semi-automatic weapon, is extra magazines. Especially for a go-to rifle like an AR, an AK, uh, having extra magazines is going to give you an advantage. And a lot of times you can keep these loaded. You can have extra magazines, but also a way to carry your magazines. You want to at least have some magazine pouches, even if it's on a battle belt, plate carrier, whatever. Uh, you know, being able to carry those extra magazines. A lot of times with cargo pockets, uh, you can slip these in your pocket, the extra mags, and it gives you some advantage. But you don't want to be carrying them in one hand and <laughs> having to defend yourself uh, with another one. So the, the parts around it. Now, one thing I want to uh, really kind of talk about a little bit before we get into our next one 
is whatever, especially handgun or even rifle that you have or shotgun, whatever firearm that you're depending on, have some parts set back. And for you to really be able to use those parts, you're going to need to know a little bit about your firearm. One of the things, and you may hate Glocks, and uh, you know a lot of people either love them or hate them. Uh, for me, I've been shooting Glocks for years and years. And Glocks are one of the easiest guns to maintain. Uh, and it doesn't mean that sometimes they don't break because they can. But you can fix a Glock unless it's a cracked slide or a cracked barrel or something. Um, and that's going to be really rare. But the different parts that go in it, you can completely rebuild that gun. The layman can do it. It doesn't take any special tools. It's a very simple handgun. So you may have a Beretta M9 that you love, and that's what your go-to gun is. But I would highly recommend putting back a Glock pistol and taking it apart, replacing parts on it, checking it out. It's really simple to do. And in fact, we call it the Tinker Toys or the Legos of the, of the handgun. AR-15 is very similar to that. You can take it apart. You can do whatever you need to. You can change the barrel out. You can change all the parts in it. You can put new triggers in it. And all those things will give you a really good knowledge of not only the firearm, but you can have extra parts set back that you can install if you need to. So those are two recommendations. And the reason is not because I'm myopic and that's all I care about. I don't. I have a lot of other different firearms. In fact, what I'm carrying right now is a 1911. And those are more difficult to maintain than a Glock pistol. But I just want to give you that tip that a Glock pistol and an AR-15 are very easy to maintain. And if something goes wrong, if you have the parts available, you can replace them and you can fix them. So that is a, a big plus. Okay, let's go to some questions. And then we're going to talk about the last. But the last is also very important. Uh, Bob McAllister asks, hey, guys, can you store up coffee? And if so, how? Thanks. Um, well, you know, a lot of times when you buy coffee, it's already sealed. It's sealed in freeze-dried bags. Uh, it tends to last a little bit longer. The, the problem is if I was going to store coffee, it would be coffee beans, and then I would grind them up. Uh, I think once you grind the coffee up, it's going to reduce the shelf life. Uh, I'm a big coffee drinker, and coffee does have a shelf life. Uh, you know, sometimes, in fact, we store up coffee. And so we try to keep it rotated in and out. And that's the thing it is with all your food sources is you need to just keep them rotated out and keep fresh coming in, but use the old stock first. But with coffee, uh, you know, that can be can be a problem because it will go bad. It starts to kind of taste a little acidic and it has kind of a different taste to it the older it gets. Uh, so, you know, as far as with the freeze dried bags, leave them sealed. Uh, but honestly, I don't know the exact shelf life of coffee, but I think that, um, you know, vacuum sealing them. Also, you could take a vacuum sealer and take the freeze dried or the where the coffee has been uh, sealed in those Mylar bags and reseal it, you know, in a vacuum sealer. Maybe it'll give it more uh, more lifespan. But the fact is, is coffee is going to go bad after a while. My recommendation would be to store up some coffee beans and have a grinder. Uh, Gary Hernandez, Self Defense and Urban Survival, yeah. ask hello. Question: What is a good wrist watch you recommend for preppers that will not break the bank? Thanks. Well, you know, like I've got one right now on, and number one would be an automatic watch or a wind-up watch. But I think automatics tend to last a little bit longer. Uh, this is a uh, Invicta, and um, where I got the reason I even started getting these was nothing fancy. <laughs> nothing fancy. He loves watches and he's been doing some stuff on the fact. He just did something on watches. Uh, these are really good watches. And um, there's a company, I think it's Jonas Jonas. Uh, that's the name of the company that I typically buy them from, but I buy the automatics because I wanted, I don't want to worry about the batteries. I do have some with batteries that are quartz, but I love the automatic watches or wind up watches. Uh, Luminac, Luminous is, is a good one, or what is that? It's not Luminous, but there, there's some other good companies uh, that have watches, but I would look for a, and these are very reasonable, actually. Invicta is typically pretty expensive, but these on uh, Jonas, I don't know, I can't remember the exact website name, but um, they have a lot of discount watches, and they have good quality watches. And if you want to look, Nothing Fancy talks about a lot of watches, and I highly recommend his channel anyway. He's one of my, my faves 
uh, and a good friend of mine. But uh, he's influenced me to buy some of those watches, but automatic watches or at least wind up watches. Uh, Justin Hopkins asks, when you prep and as you progress, do you find or anticipate a small little selection of your preps that you can use to pass along to neighbors in the event things get rough? For example, in my preps, I notice I have a ton of weapons outside of my primary stuff that I could use to assist neighbors in banding together in certain events. That's a, I mean, that is important. Uh, this is the thing about prepping, guys, and, and whether you get all the supplies you need. These are basics. But one of the biggest assets to prepping are people. Now, some people go, well, you know, they're going to get in on my food. Well, your food's not going to last but so long anyway. So you need to have a group that can work together and to, to solve problems. And having people is going to be very important. Uh, two, they can, we can divide the labor up, which, you know, could be uh, very taxing. Uh, whether it's security, whether it's going and, and procuring firewood for your stoves or whatever you're using. Uh, so having people is a vital thing. So, yes, I think that's a great idea. I do the same thing. Uh, we as a, as a family, uh, our thing is, is we want to give at least 10 percent of our food if we need to uh, or more if we have to, because we want to help others. And guys, one thing about prepping doesn't mean that you now are, you know, well, this is my stuff and nobody else is going to take it. And I've worked hard for it. I understand, you know, for just people coming and, and they'll take everything you have if you're not careful. And so you, you need to have some concern about you and your family. But we did a video about this, about people coming and saying, hey, you know, I know where to go when things go rough, go down and you'd like bring your food. But on the other hand, be willing to help people. People are vital. People are your best asset. And, um, one thing that we do, one thing I've done is I have uh, liquor is one thing that I've stored up, it's things that I don't drink. And um, but I have some stored up for barter, for trading. You're talking about somebody wanting something after SHTF <laughs> and they can't get a drink. They're going to want a drink. Uh, Tobacco is a little bit more difficult because, you know, but any of the vices, those are great things to be able to store back for people. Uh, that uh, especially in a grid down situation that you can barter with. So there is barter. There is helping people. If your neighbors don't have a gun and yet they can help protect you, giving them a gun with some ammunition is just going to be to your best interest as long as you're good friends with them. <laughs> so, yes, I think that's a great idea. Uh, Robin and VA asks, on the lifeboat bars, do they really only last five years? Example, canned goods may say best by 2025. But we use it 10 years past that. So what about the lifeboat bars? Yeah, I, I think that lifeboat, you know, usually it'll say best by date or, you know, how long these will last. Uh, typically five years and these are marked with the date. The one thing I've found, though, is that the vacuum seal on here after a while on some, not on these white ones. These white ones seem to hold up the best, but they will start to separate. They'll just start to open up and some air has gotten in it. That's going to be your danger. As long as it's sealed like this, it should last as long as it it's sealed. Uh, so what I would do is, is if, you know, you may even want to reseal some of them or put them in some kind of vacuum pack and, and pack them down uh, to keep them from getting shelf, you know, from, but a lot of times the silver ones tend to loosen up and they, they kind of puff out a little bit and, and it's loose. And I'm like, okay, those are, those are gone. Uh, so yeah, I think that they will last longer than five years, but that's a good measure to be able to go by. Um, so, and just like the canned food, just like any of this stuff, just like medications, guys, it'll say expired, but all it means is, is it's expired from its maximum potency. Uh, the more, you know, you have extra time to be able to use those if you need to. The problem is if it gets too past, sometimes expired medications can actually be dangerous. So if you have things that you are putting back, do some research and guys don't be lazy, do research on whatever you're doing. Uh, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to fix it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy me an a instant bug out bag and I'm going to buy me a bunch of, you know, this big thing of food. And I'm going to just set it back and I'm good to go. You need to check those things out. Don't be lazy. All right. Um, let's go to our next point. And that is a bug out bag. Now, when it comes to bug out bags, that is not your primary uh, being prepared is not running out and buying a bug out bag and something that if you need to leave your home, that you've got a bag. This is a last ditch. You're a glorified refugee and you're in trouble. I mean, you are in trouble. FEMA even recommends that you have a large container with pretty much a bug out bag. 
that you can take on the road if you need to evacuate your house. So a lot of us, including myself, it's going to be hell or high water before I leave all my supplies, all my food source, all the stuff I have. But it could get down to that. Uh, if a group, a large group comes against you, you know, guys, it's either life or death. You know, you're going to choose to have to leave, especially if maybe there's a big fire and it burns up your supplies. Being able to have some things set aside uh, with the bug out bag, uh, it's called a Bob, and it has a three day supply of survival items in here. Now, I'm not going to go through them all. Number one, we don't have time, but having your bag set up and the way I set my bag up is I go by what we call the rule of threes. And that means I can live three minutes without air. I can live three hours in extreme harsh conditions, whether it's cold or hot. I can live three days without water. I can live three weeks without food. So I need to base my priorities around that first. Now, medical and self-defense flow in between. That could happen before you need your bug out bag. So having medical and self-defense is vital but having a way to be able to protect your breathing, whether it's not necessarily a respirator, which could be, but it's going to take up room out of your bag, but just a bandana to be able to cover your face. Uh, and that'll keep smoke and debris uh, out so you can breathe longer. Uh, and a bandana has a bazillion uses. Uh, but also then when it comes to extreme temperatures, having something to keep you warm. There are a ton of different emergency space blankets out there. And SOL makes their space bibby. And it's something that's like that material, that mylar material, that you can actually crawl into like a sleeping bag. And it can keep you warm. And it'll last you longer than those really cheap little mylar flimsy bags. I put some of those in some different packs for a last ditch emergency. All hell's breaking loose and I have nothing else. But they won't last. And it's really not suitable. You need something with a little more uh, to keep you warm. One thing I like to have in here, in fact, there's one in here now, is a Wooby. And that's a U.S. military uh, poncho liner. And they're made from a really light material, but they're insulated and it can keep you warm. Uh, you'll need coats and things like that. We had a friend of ours that was her and her boyfriend at the time were driving and it got so cold that it actually froze. I think it crystallized the gas in their gas filter. It was a very weird thing. And so they were in the middle of nowhere and broke down and there was nothing anywhere. And it, the temperatures were like below 20 degrees. And so she had a blanket in the back because her dad always said, have a blanket with you at all times. She got that blanket out. She wrapped up. Her boyfriend went to get help and they did. But having a blanket or something in your vehicle or, or in your bag, a way to stay warm, having a way to have water. You can get dehydrated. You need to have water and having a water filter of uh, your food source. And one thing that's really easy is carrying something like this or lifeboat food. And it's really easy to do. Lifeboat food is probably the easiest because you don't have to prepare it. You can just eat it. And again, it, it doesn't cause you to get thirsty. Uh, and of course, your medical supplies, having maybe a couple of extra magazines and some ammunition. It's weighty. So you got to remember um, and possibly some kind of tarp or tent, uh, and things like that, but go by the rule of threes, set up your bag. There's a ton of different videos out there on how to build out your bug out bag. So we're not going to get into too many details, but there's a lot of different options. And here is one of my, what I call get home bags. Now this is something that I carry in my car at all times. I could be in a massive wreck somewhere and there could be cars crashed. Every I have my bag. I get it out. I'm able to go. There could be a roadblock. They could be closed off. Roads could be closed off. I have to abandon my vehicle. Do I have a way to carry my needed supplies? Even if I'm across town, it may still take me 12 hours to get home. And so this helps me to make it home. Now, this is a little bit larger get home bag for me. I mean, it's 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 a big bag. So for, what I really like is maybe a day pack. Uh, it's got less room in it, but it's lighter and it has the items, though, that I need. One of the things that I always put in all my bags is a heavy meal trash bag. And I can set that up. Keeps me out of the elements if I need to. 
I can fill up things with it. I can carry stuff with it. I can repair things. If I need to lay on the ground, I can put it down, especially in wet conditions. I can lay on the ground. There's a ton of different things. In fact, we did a video about heavy mail trash bags. It's the contractor's bags. It's not your standard trash bags, but they work the same. But a fire kit. And guys, I know we talked about Exotac fire kits. Having a fire kit is vital for all of these different things. Um, being able to keep you warm, being able to boil your food, being able to cook your food, boil your water for purification, uh, give you light, gives you heat. Fire kit is essential. And guys, don't, again, rely on just a big lighter. Well, I got my big lighter. I got some matches. Sometimes they get wet. Things happen. Have a few multiple items. Put them in a small pouch. It's what I call my fire kit. When I look in my bag, I've got my fire kit. I pull it right out. There it is. I have all the items that I need. So um, build your fire kit. And again, Exotac is great. It's 20% off using Suits 20, and they are solid fire tools. But whatever you do, there's a lot of different options out there. Uh, and again, water filtration. So get home bag is really what I plan for. A bug out bag is set back. Now, one thing that's a danger, and this is something you got to be careful of, don't get into your get home bag. Don't get into your bug out bag and get items out. And then you don't ever put them back because about the time you need them, you're going to realize it. Listen, guys, in normal everyday life, I have had to use items out of my get home bag, going on trips, doing something. Uh, one time I ran out of gas, just did. My light didn't come on. I ran out of gas with my car because it's a Hummer and it has a deep uh, gasoline uh, where you put the gas in using one of those emergency gas cans doesn't work. It won't do it. It won't work. I had to take some paracord out of this, strap it to the safety, pull it back. So it would allow me to put gas in it. One time I got my GPS went out uh, while I was on this back road. There was just no GPS. I had a map, a road map in here. I was able to get to the highway because of this roadmap. And, um, and so, guys, there are so many things that you could have what I like to call a personal SHTF. It's not into the world. Nobody else is experiencing it. Nobody even knows it but you. But these items come in handy to get you through. Not necessarily a life-saving situation, but just get you through whatever you're dealing with. So having a good bag with some supplies in it is just peace of mind. And it's just great to have. And again, I just did a review on this one. And uh, this is a Roaring Fire Gear. It's, um, and I can't remember the name of it all of a sudden, but I think it's the Brush Fire. Yes, yeah, the Brush Fire. This is a great little small, it's, it's fairly small, but that's what I wanted. And so we did a video on it and you can check it out. But um, it has all the contents, went through all the contents of this bag. And again, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube for that. But guys, again, Top five is food, water, medical, self-defense, and then having yourself a get-home bag. And guys, it doesn't have to be a bag. You can have, it like FEMA recommends, have a container that you can put in the back of your car. The problem is, if you have to abandon your vehicle, you're really going to want to have some kind of backpack to be able to carry those items. Also, a couple of little tidbits. You want to have some good boots. If you're wearing flip-flops during the summer and you're stuck somewhere, having a good pair of boots in the back of your vehicle is going to be a lifesaver, especially in a grid-down situation where there could be debris and things around. And also, a very important thing, too, is a knife, a good fixed-blade knife. And that should be in your bag, but that should also, you should have a good, solid fixed-blade knife. This is up-armored knives. Uh, this is a, this he does some great work, but uh, I've had that one for years. Have a good knife. Knives have been around since the beginning. When man could form tools, one of the first tools he formed was a knife. And for because there's so many different uses. But there you go, guys. So a lot of different things to consider. But guys, if you're just getting started, hopefully this will get you started on a path to at least take care of the priorities. And then you can add other things as they come up. So we're going to sign off again. Exotac 20% off using Suit 20 with the link down below in the description. And uh, we really do appreciate Exotac. And we appreciate all you guys that do buy these uh, products because we get a, a, a nice little check every month. But I'm telling you guys, I can really stand behind these. I love Exotac. Uh, also, we want to give a big thank you to Sarah Mack for 
uh, monitoring the questions and getting the questions to us and really helping set up everything. Guys, take responsibility for your own survival. And in the world we live in right now, whether it's economic, political, world stage, world war, who knows what's going to happen next. Do a few things to give yourself some peace of mind. And again, this is just going to give you some time to be able to make other decisions instead of being in a panic when something happens. Be strong. Be of good courage. God bless America. Long live the republic.